<laughs> hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to Better Together. We've got some interesting little music going on today. When you know better, you get better. Thanks for joining us today, July 13th, 2020. Just another Manic Monday here. <laughs> Is that Blondie? Blondie, right? No, the um, the Bangles. The it's Bangles. Just another Manic Monday. Wish it was Sunday. Oh, oh. That's my fun day. <laughs> Where I don't have to run day. It's just another Manic Monday. Damn, that was Damn. my raspy morning voice. That was good. Oh, man, guys, today I am beyond excited because we are going to learn from someone amazing. Glennon Doyle, who wrote the New York Times bestselling book Love Warrior, who now wrote Untamed that came out in March just during the quarantine, um, is going to be our guest today. And I am so excited. This book is incredible. Um, I was just kind of like writing notes and trying to figure out kind of all the big aha moments, which is like every other page that I have marked and underlined. And, you know, it's my favorite thing with books. That's why it's so hard to lend my books because they're so personal because I write all my notes. I'm like, me, this is me or shit, I got to do this or whatever. And you're like, I don't want everyone else to read my issues, but that's what I do with these. Um, but I just kind of was like, okay, let me just highlight my kind of aha moments from this book. And it goes from like, and Jeff, you know, I, I know you read this, like yeah. it goes from caged to compromise, to fitting in, to denying yourself. She yep. talks about snow globes, destruction to construction to rebirth, and then the human experience and how we're all thinking that we're doing this wrong, but we're all doing it wrong, right? Like we're all going through this journey, right? Like yeah. of life. That's just life. It's not supposed to be perfect. Um, I love the way you phrased it. I mean, I love how she used images to convey all that too, like the cage and then like the keys. I just think yeah. for those who haven't read the book, you'll want to after this interview, obviously, oh. but it's written in short form essays that all use these beautiful images to tell the story of her life and really the story of anyone who's ever felt like they're not living the life they should be. Yeah. It's really, really beautiful. Which is a lot of people, yeah. right? So a lot of us are told what we're supposed to be at a young age. She talks about 10 being kind of that defining moment. Yep. Um, a lot of us are told who we're supposed to be and then we just try to fit that mold, right? Like that's where fitting in comes in. And then at some point you start feeling like you're denying yourself and that's where angst probably comes from. And you know, then you're you know maybe going down paths because you're suppressing and repressing and, um, and then you know, you continue to make poor choices because you're basing them on what other people think you should be doing or say you should be doing and that's not matching up with your inner being. And then, boom, you wake up one day and you're like, I hate my life. Yeah. <laughs> and if you aren't outwardly saying it, you are living that because you are unhappy and you don't know why you're unhappy. You know, when you're just like, Arr! and you just can't figure it out. Um, especially because you feel like you're living the life you're supposed to, because you were told to live that life. So it's, that's the torture is like, I, I don't feel happy. My inner voice is telling me something else. And yet I followed all the rules. Why aren't mm -hmm. I happy? What? Like, I feel like that's the sort of story that resonated with me. Even, you know, she says this book is specifically targeted toward women, which in a way it is, but I also resonated with a lot of what I read in this book. It's really, really incredible well, stuff. Well, Jeff, I'd have to think you grew up in the Midwest, right? Yeah. Everyone who grows up there is supposed to be a certain something, right? Like yeah. I, I stereotype you guys. I'm like, oh my God, I love Midwesterners. They're so sweet. Well, yeah. guess what? What if you're not sweet? Right. Do you have to fit that mold? It's, right? I, it's interesting. You bring up a great point. And you know, Glennon, it's interesting. We come from really similar church backgrounds too. Like I've known who Glennon Doyle is for like over a decade because very interestingly, the church my sister interned at when she was even younger than me was the church Glennon went to and was raised in. And she's pivoted a lot since then. She's lived all these kind of different lives, but as an influential thought leader in all of them. So it's really, she's just fascinating. Yeah. I, I fully understand um, that kind of that that uh, desire to please, especially as girls, right? You're taught to be a good girl and all of that. And that's why 
Uh, Anita Morjani was such an incredible guest for me. She wrote the book Dying to Be Me. And I so understood, especially growing up in an immigrant household, um, you know, there are all these kind of ideals of what you're supposed to be, even like on another level, I feel like. And where my American friends had a little bit more leeway and they could just be themselves, whatever, like we had to make sure everybody knew we were perfect yeah. <laughs> in the church. What are they going to say? And, and all of that. And so I know my journey after my brain tumor was um, apparent to me as a rebirth. And she talks about kind of destruction of the old to construction of the new and your rebirth. And I approached it like that. And that's why I wrote my dad a letter and said, when I come out of this, should I come out of this? I'm going to live a very different life. I'm going to live the life that makes me happy. That it's maybe going to be different than what you've been seeing. Because before I was like racking up accolades to be like, look, dad, look, look, mom, look. And that wasn't serving me anymore and it wasn't making me happy anymore. And so um, I didn't want to feel pressure from them and I wanted them to just love me the way I was without, um, without kind of um, the prerequisites, let's say, right? That's why we love dogs because they just love us for us, yeah. right? That's why that love is so pure and so different than the love for your spouse, your parents, your kids, or whatever. I know, I don't know what it's like to have kids, so I know that that's, that could be different, I don't know, but my parents love their dog, and they've said to me, Mario, we love him more than you people. And guess what? I said, I understand that, because he loves you unconditionally, yeah. right? I love you, I think, unconditionally, but guess what? I have some conditions, like, Mom, I want you to keep trying, don't quit right with your cancer like keep fighting I'm, I'm getting frustrated with her when she quits in certain areas right yeah so no matter what humans are going to have some conditions and and that's why you know the love with animals i think is just so such a gift and if we could model that as humans well that would be amazing I don't know if we're perfect enough like dogs to be able to do that um, but what a great example they set um, but yeah, I think this is, uh, this is so amazing. I haven't gotten to the quote of the day, but here we go. When a woman finally learns that pleasing the world is impossible, she becomes free to learn how to please herself. And that is from Glennon Doyle, our guest today. Ooh, damn. I love that. Me too. Guys, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do. Maria Menounos. Uh, we're going to continue to bring you this amazing content, but we do want to um, ask for your help in building that out. And you'll get those little notifications that will remind you that a Glennon Doyle is going to be on the show so you don't miss it. Um, and as we always say, we're better together. So if you could help us by rating, commenting, subscribing, um, we would be so grateful. We see those numbers going up and we see the, the um, reviews coming in and we're so grateful for it because... We can't do it alone. So we're better together. And if you could help us, that would be amazing. And of course, if you haven't joined our Patreon, please do. That's where we kind of deepen our work. We go deep diving on some amazing YouTube videos that we can't do here. And, um, and we learn together. So please join us there. Uh, some really sad news. Um, last night, I, right before I went to bed, I looked on Twitter, my Ugh, social media. <laughs> oh, you know, I, I know. really am hoping social media gets murdered. <laughs> I'm right behind Whoa. you. I think a lot of people are right behind you. On I that really one. think it needs to die. It needs to be murdered, shut down. Let's call it a day. Um, let's go back to pen pals. She talks about that. She agrees with you, Maria, and she'll want to talk about really? that. Really? Yeah. She says that like social media is one of the biggest deaths to our own inner voice because it's these outside voices that still continue to prevent us from discovering who we are. So Damn. definitely a, a conversation she'll want to talk about if you do. Please, can yes. we create the like spiritual Navy SEALs yeah, I love to it. come murder social media <laughs> and just end it? Like we need a nuke social media. Anyhow, I did go on it last night. Um, very briefly, and saw that Kelly Preston, John Travolta's wife, had tragically passed away. Um, she was diagnosed with breast cancer two years ago, had been bravely fighting it. Um, 
I had no idea. I, and I guess nobody else did either. They kept it private. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's so sad. Of course, they lost their son, Jet, um, years oh ago. And so a lot of kind of tragedy that they've had to deal with in their family. Um, so our hearts go out to, or my heart goes out to John and his family. They're very sweet people. Um, have always been kind to me. And uh, that was just like the shock of a lifetime for me last night. I was just like, <gasps> I know. I, I texted my family in my little group chat. And I did the same as you, Maria. It was like I went on Twitter right before bed, which I always tell myself to not do. Mm -hmm. And it was like the whole, the Naya stuff. And now this, it's just like, oh my God. Yeah, what is the latest on Naya? I know so they're, they're still, still looking, the founder. right? But Heather Morris, who worked with her on Glee um, the other day, came out and said that she wanted to help. Like she, she wrote a letter to the sheriff's department. It was like, I want to help. Let me help however I can. I want to look for my friend. So yeah. they're still hopeful, I mean. I'm it's so crazy hopeful. to me that they never hung up signs. They've known that this is a dangerous lake and that people never hung up signs to let people know. I mean, listen, you know, whether people would have listened or not, I don't know. Um, I agree. But it's just how, how hard is it to hang up a sign I if know. you're, you know, whatever. And the difference it can make, you know, even if it's just it's been double digit fatalities over the last decade in that lake which is unacceptable. And I, you're right, Maria, who knows if we yeah. would have posted those signs. Um, I'm seeing in our chat that they said they found a body at the same lake. Have you guys looked at that? Looking it up right now. I just saw that. Oof. Oh, the steamer is all over it. I love it. Um, well, hopefully. Um, yeah, they found her at a, at a lake. This they did eight, find her. Eight minutes her? ago on CNN. Yeah. Wait, so Naya, Naya was found? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, my God. It says a body. Okay, right. Bo body found at a lake where the Glee actress was missing. So sorry, okay. they haven't confirmed it's her yet, but they did find a body at the okay. lake. Okay. Wow. Okay. Sorry Eight minutes ago. Oof. Well, we'll see because there have been other people that have drowned there, but I, right. I some don't sources know. are, and granted, this is TMZ, but are reporting that it is in fact her. Um, well, actually, TMZ is pretty reputable. Yeah. <laughs> I have not seen TMZ be wrong, to be yeah. honest. So I mean, it's. Let's just say right now it's very likely that Naya's It's so sad. Like, I kept hoping that it wouldn't be the case and maybe, like, she was going to turn up or something. I don't know. Um, but anyhow, um, sad, sad stuff. Wow. Um, and, you know, Corona just keeps climbing, so here's some more sad. But let's go to some good news. Good news Monday, Because yeah, it's Good News Monday. Yes. And we have our partnership with the Good News Movement, who we love. Michelle Figueroa's incredible platform that helps us see humanity and the beauty in the world. So um, this... Uh, this is a really beautiful story. And Jeff, I'm just going to kick it to you. To Yeah, I love this, Maria. This is like, it reminds me of my old days because I used to love camping and still do when I can. But um, in England, an elderly neighbor empowered his young boy neighbor to like, how do I phrase this? Oh, f go find adventure. So he gave the boy a tent and said, go live your life, go find adventure. This was right before the pandemic started. So every day since the pandemic started, this boy has been camping in his backyard in his tent, using it as a way to raise money for COVID. So he's like fulfilling the wishes of his elderly neighbor while raising money for the pandemic. Just a boss move from this English kid. <laughs> I just think it's so sweet. Like, yeah. Like, he could have easily just taken the tent and been like, thanks, dude. Exactly. Like, so cool. Guys, let's go play, like, Twitch in there and whatever. Let's go, <laughs> let's go play Twitch. <laughs> let's go play Twitch. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Totally. The thing I love, it reminded me of Up. Have you guys seen that movie? Yes. Have get we it. seen that? M what? Up oh, is the movie really where the young boy scout and the elderly man go on an adventure together. And, you know, they form this beautiful relationship. And oh, I love the idea yeah. of an elderly man empowering the youth of today's world to li go live an adventure. Yeah. So cool. I cry every time. So we need to watch it again. Okay. Such a good movie. Love up. All right. All right. Well, I say we get to our interview because I can't wait. Uh, Glennon Doyle is the author of the number one New York Times bestsellers, Untamed and Love Warrior and Carry On. 
um, Carry On Warrior. Glennon is an activist, thought leader, and the founder and president of Together Rising, an all-women-led nonprofit organization that's revolutionized grassroots philanthropy, raising over $25 million for women, families, and children in crisis. Her work, of course, has been celebrated and endorsed by Oprah Winfrey. Not sure if anybody knows her, but she's... Um, pretty She's powerful. Pretty powerful, yeah. I think I've heard of her. <laughs> uh, Reese Witherspoon, Brene Brown, who we love as well, ladies and gentlemen. Glennon Doyle, how are you? Maria, hello. How are you? It's amazing to be speaking with you. I am so excited to be speaking with you. Oh. Like, I so excited. Part of this. Oh my gosh, the good news made me, I needed that. I needed Did, that little right? slice of good news. Yeah, I know. We really try to, to bring good news into the world or betterment and such, but it's hard to avoid some of the sad news out there too. So, you know, we try to balance it off. Yeah, we always say the world is brutal and the world is beautiful. So in my family, we say life is brutal all the time. Brutiful. <laughs> thing, all I like the time, that. right? Well, first of all, that's real, right? Mm -hmm. It, it mm -hmm. is what it is. But also, um, the more you really kind of look at things, right? Contrast is, it's essential, right? Yeah. And yeah, so- that's what I that's the best. That's, you know, we need a different system. We need a way to feel happiness without also accessing grief, but I haven't found it. Right. I think that's what I figured out when I got sober was that, Oh, if I want to feel joy and the highs, then I have to also accept pain and the lows, right? Yeah. It's all or nothing. Ugh. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard because, you know, you have to go through the death and destruction like you talk about to get to the rebirth and that shit in the middle is what sucks mm. but you can't get there without it so you can either live in purgatory forever or you can say i'm gonna go through the weeds through the muck to get to the island over there that's pretty and maybe you can't see it but you know it's there yeah. Or you're hoping it's there and you have no friggin' choice because the island's burning behind you <laughs> right. and you're like, and shit, you're I gotta go through. Water. <laughs> right? But that's life. Yeah. That's life. And God, if I, that is the one thing that I have figured out. The one thing, Maria, that I have figured out. Which <laughs> I think is you figured out a lot of things. <laughs> there is just no, well, you use the term purgatory. There is no resurrection without the crucifixion first. Yeah right? That all of our problems come from trying to get to the resurrection without allowing ourselves to be crucified first, right? And that's the, and you know, we do that in big ways. We do that by calling for peace and love and light without first asking for justice, right? Because that's the, the pain before the rising, but we do it in our regular lives too, you know? I, I numbed my hard feelings for 20, for 17 years. That's what addiction was, Yeah, you know? Um, and it wasn't until I committed to, well, I sat down at a recovery meeting and I was struggling so much. And this woman sat down next to me and she said, I just want you to know that all feelings are for feeling, even the hard ones. And I was like, what? <laughs> it felt like such a light bulb because we live in a culture that tells us that just happiness and gratitude and joy are for feeling. Yeah. And that pain and doubt and anger and jealousy and all of those kind of feelings are for numbing and deflecting and pretending we don't have, right? So yeah, all the transformation in my life came when I just realized, oh, I'm sp being human isn't about feeling happy. It's about feeling everything, Yeah. right? Even when that makes us a little less pleasant and efficient. Yeah, I mean, we had, um... Jeff, what was it? Dr. Susan David on yeah. the other day talking about exactly that, mm. um, Harvard psychologist and how important all the feelings are and that um, it can't just be about happiness because those other feelings are there as signals. Mm -hmm. And if you're not listening to the signals, then you can't 
it's like the signals are there to say, oh, there might be another path you might want to go on, or there might mm -hmm. be a new decision you want to make. And when you're so heads down, this is why I think trauma is like, you know, losing your job or whatever kind of destruction happens. And we've gone through something similar recently. You know, your head's down, you're working, 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 and you never look up. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not going to look up, I think God just says, let me throw a few bricks down at you. <laughs> And so the bricks come down and then you look up and you're like, oh shit, I've been in a gerbil wheel going, 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 not thinking about this in any other way. But first you go through pain. You're like, why, why, why God, why? why? <laughs> and then you wake up and you're like, oh shit, maybe that was an old model. Maybe that wasn't serving me anymore. Maybe I've outgrown that. Maybe that's not the way this business should run anymore. Maybe, oh, then you start ideating. And then, mm -hmm. and then when you're open to something new, new downloads come in and then you're like, oh, okay, maybe we'll go this way. And guess what? Maybe it won't work, but that was definitely not friggin' working. That's right. And so that's, right. that's why shit happens. And that's why I love the notion that life is happening for you, not to you, because yeah. even the bad is there to help you to get to the good. And specifically, I mean, it's just, I can't believe that whole thing you just did. I, I, I am going through that exact situation right now that you just described with something with my work. So it's just amazing and affirming wow. to, to hear you describe that entire destruction before. Yeah. Um, well, we'll talk after because I already know what yeah. it is. I just felt it because I just went through it and I can oh. help you. Not that you need my help, but at the same time, we all need each other and we're better together. Yes, Maria. Thank <laughs> God. It's so, life is so terrifying. And the only way to get through is with other people who are equally terrified, but also honest. Yes. Right? Honest about all of it. Yeah, it's but, hard. You know, these, that, that whole destruction thing is real. Mm -hmm. and, and I know the pattern, right? I never know what's going to happen next in my life, but I do now know the pattern mm -hmm. that like, it's always first the pain, then the waiting and then the rising, yes. right? So the thing happens. And then even though I know that after pain usually comes newness, that doesn't matter. I'm still panicked, Suffering. upset. I'm, I'm freaking out like it's yes. never happened before. Yes. Like my life is over. Even though there's a little voice saying, oh, this is just the pain part. That doesn't matter. Yes. Like you, we recover you know, quicker though, because we've gone through the pattern so many times. Yes. That's why it's awesome to be in our forties. <laughs> Thank you, God. Yes, because yes. we've gone through this so many times that like, I feel like that period of shit gets truncated down a little bit. So it's not as extended. And then we also know how to reach out to people to not live in the silo alone so that we can get some help to come in and some rescue boats to come help us. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then there's the waiting where you don't know yet what all of that shit just meant and you think it might all be meaningless and you're looking forward to the rising, but you also really don't believe it'll come. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. You just think it's death. <laughs> yeah. You just think it's, you're dead. Yep. And then comes the rising. So there's that, there's that process, which I've experienced so many freaking times, but it's what I've also experienced is the specificity of hard emotions and what they can actually teach you, right? Like, like envy. Okay, so envy is this emotion that we're supposed to pretend we don't have, right? We think that that's, it's shameful or we know we're not supposed to be jealous of each other or whatever. So we pretend we don't, ha we don't have it or better yet, if you're me, you kind of like, like envy is admiration that's holding its breath. So you can, you can twist it into snark. That's always good. So if someone's doing something awesome that you're jealous of, I can switch it into like, oh, well, I never liked her anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It's this awesome, terrible thing that my heart does. But what I realized, so when I was drinking all the time, if somebody handed me a book that was written by a woman that was beautiful, I could not read it. Mm, my husband I has would, that problem. I would not. It was like staring straight at the sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And so I eventually realized that the reason I couldn't read the words that a woman had written was because I knew somewhere deep inside that a truer, beautiful, more braver, you know, healthier version of me could do that. Yep. 
and I wasn't doing it. And there's nothing more painful than watching someone else doing the thing that you know that you were meant to do, but you're not doing. So that's when I figured out, oh, envy, we are all wasting it. We're wasting, it's, envy is actually- It's a signal. With it. It's a signal. It's pointing us towards what we were meant to create yeah. in the world, right? But we waste it because we think we're supposed to be ashamed of it or not happen mm-hmm. or not have it because nobody teaches us not to be ashamed of negative emotions, but to use them as instructive. Now, I, I have learned that negative emotions are instructive, but maybe not like directional. Like maybe you shouldn't act on them all the time. I'm still learning that yeah. in my mid forties. Yeah. Like a friend just recently taught me the strategy of save as drafts. So Ooh. like when you're furious and you want to say all the things, Yeah, yeah. you can type them, but then you have to save as a draft until the next day right? To see if you're really um, wanting to be a little sweeter and kinder. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I just think these, these hard feelings are just a treasure trove of information. So how did you get from envy and that kind of like angst of, I should be doing this. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. How did you get from that? And and before, actually before, how did you get to that? Why, why do you think you weren't doing it? Well, I wasn't doing it because I was very sick. I was an alcoholic. I was a bulimic. I was not in any way. I mean, I was barely vertical. So I sure as hell wasn't going to be like writing books, right? I was just real, um, barely surviving for a very long time. Um, And then when I was 25, I found out that I was pregnant with my son, who's now almost 18. And um, something about that just really felt like it might be my last invitation to kind of come back to life because I was really, really sick. And, um, and so that's when I started going to recovery. That's when I got sober the day I found out I was pregnant with him. And um, sobriety, I mean, I think there's a, the reason why we call it recovery is because it really is a recovering of the self, right? You're kind of getting back to that self that you were before you started numbing out. Um, And that self over time, I realized was a writer. But she was that writer in me with that creative, that sensitive soul that uh, she was just covered, too covered for too long Mm -hmm. with all the addictions. You know, I mean, we can't, um, a a lot, we have to get healthy, I think, before we can actually um, create and offer to the world what we were meant to create. So, um, so how I got there, but, but they're tied Maria actually, because I started going to these recovery meetings and I just, I felt like they were the first honest people I'd ever met in my life. Mm. I, I just, I thought, Oh, this is where they keep the honest people, right? This is, these circles are where people stop acting like life is freaking easy and start telling the truth about how hard it all is, right? Mm -hmm. How hard all of it is. Like just, I'm not even talking about when extra stuff happens. I'm just talking about being human. Yep. Right? Just Just the basics. Just the basics are damn near impossible for me. (laughs) Okay, so then when extra, and and I think that, you know, I was born a very sensitive kid. That's, I think, how I ended up bulimic at 10 years old. I started numbing myself out very early. Um, So anyway, I found such connection and, and a place to breathe in these, recovery meetings. And then I started having children and I stopped having time to get to the recovery meetings. And so that's how I started writing because I wanted a place where I could use that voice that I was allowed to use in those basements of those meetings, that real, honest, true voice. So actually recovery and writing were very closely tied. Yeah. And so you did it Mm -hmm. and you did it huge. Yeah. Well, it didn't start huge. It started very small. So I um, sat down at my computer one day and there were these, there was this thing happening on Facebook called the 25 things. Uh, You might remember this. It was just for like a fad for a little while. Everybody was writing the lists of their 25 things. And I thought, oh, I could do that. I could write a list. So I put the baby down for a nap and I sat down and just wrote out the things using the voice that I, this is the, well, I'll tell you what happened. So 
I come back to my computer maybe an hour later and I'm so confused because my list has been shared all these many, many, many times from my personal page. And I look in my email and I have 39 new emails. And then I have four voicemails from my sister. So Maria, my sister is my keeper, like in all ways. So whenever there's a lot of messages from her, it means I've done something inappropriate mm-hmm. that like normal people don't do that is going to require a lot of cleanup on her part, right? <laughs> So (laughs) that's, that's her life. So this is what happened. I'll give you an example. So my number seven was I'm a recovering food and drug addict and alcohol addict, but I still find myself missing booze in the same twisted way. We can miss those who repeatedly beat us and leave us for dead. Okay. So that is true. But here's my friend, Lisa's number seven, Maria. My favorite snack food is hummus. Okay. So what happened is that I didn't read anyone else's list first, okay? I didn't do my freaking research, so- Which is amazing because that's uh, why it worked. Because you didn't have reference, you didn't try to copy everybody else and fit in. Like, oh my God, we're gonna keep it super positive and like, I love falafels. No, you were like, here's the fucking truth. But I'm sweating now when I'm telling you the story because Maria, I know, and I know it ends well. I should be able to relax in this story. But in the moment, I wanted to die. I am okay. sure. I wanted to die. I just, I wouldn't even go near my computer. Mm-hmm. That was but like then, me after Howard Stern. My first, my oh second God. appearance, I thought my life was over, over. And then I got on the streets and women were coming up to me and they're like, I love you. And I'm like, y- y- you do? What? <laughs> huh? <laughs> you're just so surprised because you were just honest and you thought your life was over because you were honest. And you know what? That's what people are most attracted to is the raw truth. We're just all too friggin' scared to do it. I know. I know. So I finally, after, I don't know, 36 hours, I finally got brave enough to start opening these emails. And same, same. Like they were from people who I had known my whole life. I swear it was like we'd never spoken before because they were saying things like, oh my God, Glennon, my my father's been depressed for 10 years and we've never spoken about it outside the home. Oh my God, Glennon, my marriage is struggling, but we're not talking about it. My, oh, Me too, me too, me too, right? And I thought, oh my God, we are down here acting so, like we are so busy acting like our lives are perfect and shiny that we are not bringing to each other the stuff that we were meant to help each other carry. Yeah. It's so ridiculous Mm -hmm. right and we're all trying to be shiny and admired Mm -hmm. and then nobody freaking knows us Mm -hmm. and then we wonder why we're lonely because being admired is not the same as being loved and known yep right so so after i read those emails i was like damn maybe this like shamelessness thing i have which if I have any gift, Maria, that's it. It's like when they were passing well, lo- out shame. No, I marked it I in the book. You're like, me. shamelessness is my spiritual teacher. Yes. Like, I, I was like, oh my God, yes. <laughs> they, missed, they missed me with the shame, you know, when they were giving it out. So, <laughs> and it's, you know, so I thought, okay, I could use this thing, the shamelessness that's been, you know, a liability as like what I do. Because it is this truth telling thing can unlock people and Mm -hmm. help them be less lonely. And what else are we trying to do down here? Except just all be a little less lonely. Yep. So true. (laughs) Oh my God. This is so amazing. Um, Maria, that was one of those times, right? Where I was like, Oh, I did the thing. uh It's over. My life is over. I have to move to like a rainforest (laughs) without the internet for the rest of my life. I have brought shame upon my family. Yes. I will never be able to walk outside of my neighborhood again. You know, I was sure life was over. And then eventually it was that process you just talked about in the beginning. Like, wait, maybe I stumbled into and onto something here. Yeah. Right. But it's amazing how often creativity starts with embarrassment. (laughs) It's true. Yeah. Yeah. It really does. And and when you talk about shiny, it, it brings me to just... I was telling everybody, I I reached out to an old boss about a month ago and I said, do you remember in 2008, I was in your office and it was me, you and Billy Bush and a couple of other people. 
and everybody was trying to get me to join Twitter. And I was like, I feel like social media is the devil. I am mm. terrified. I was terrified, Glennon, to get on social media. But mm -hmm. I did it because it was the thing to do. And I like, you know, begrudgingly did it. And I just feel like we need to create a Navy SEAL team <laughs> to take it out. It's got to go. It needs to be murdered. Like we need to nuke social media. And I know you mm -hmm. um, have similar feelings that you might want to share <laughs> because yeah. it perpetuates this perfectness. And it's just so disgusting because it's not any of our truths, right? Um, I mm -hmm. try to post truths in there. Um, I did it recently with my mom. She has stage four brain cancer. And I just sat there. I just had a moment where I was like, I'm sitting here with hope. And it was a message for people out there because I keep getting messages from people who are just being diagnosed. And I'm trying to use my mom as an example of hope for them. And it got so many, I mean, the most engagement, I think, since like my wedding, probably. Um, mm. Because all the other like, oh, my God, it's the pretty picture with the message now. Now it's got to be like the spiritual message and I want to just throw the frig no, it's up. It's got to be the spiritual message. Oh right? my God. It's like, it's like the person that's like holding out their hands like namaste, but they're really trying to show you their Cartier bracelet. Yes. That's, that's yeah. like social yeah. media. Listen, I know, I know. I think it's, I now I feel like the, um, the problem with the shininess and the comparison is like the least of our problems now. I used to think oh, that sure. was the worst part of social yeah, media. Yeah, yeah. Now it's just like the the demonizing of each other. And the, I mean, I was for a long time before COVID going around and ho hosting t uh, like town hall meetings in cities because I was like, you guys, we have got to talk to each other oh, again. Yeah. yeah. Like there is no, people used to solve problems in communities with their communities. Yeah. Right. And then when you look at, you know, when you look at somebody in the face, it's much harder to hate them. It's mm -hmm. much harder to not care about them. We aren't wired as human beings to have empathy and care about people that we can't see on a Twitter handle to their avatar. Like, but that's how we're trying to solve problems now. Like that's yeah. never going to work. So, um, so now I feel like, oh God, my biggest problem used to be people dancing in sunflower fields with their kids, pretending like parenting was freaking easy and now it's like you know the dissolving of our democracy <laughs> so there is you know huge fish to fry now yeah. and and on the other hand my nonprofit has raised 25 million dollars online for communities all for marginalized children and women all over the world through $25 donations all from social media. Yeah, like, that's the, the story... rub. Like I'm seeing even in our our um, social, in our chat, people are, I can't see, um, I think it's Nancy saying, but social media helps you promote your business. And absolutely, that's, that's the rub, right? All of our business deals are connected to our social media. That's why I feel like if we nuke all of it, then all we're all it. Then we all have to be creative. Then we have so to figure out a new way. But, <laughs> but whatever we started over, would have to be as democratized as social media because one of the most important parts of social media is how it's allowed marginalized voices who are never allowed onto the stage. I mean, Black Lives Matter, all of that stuff, the, the magnification and amplification of the voices we need to hear in this moment are largely because of social media platforms, mm -hmm. right? Because when power is controlling those platforms, we don't hear from those voices. Totally. So... Oh my God, it's a mixed bag, but like, it's tough. It's also just sort of a reflection of who we are, the good and the bad, mm -hmm. right? It's yeah. It's just, it's, it's empty of itself. Like social media is nothing. It's, it's a void of energy. It's like what it is, is a reflection of who we are, mm -hmm. the good, the bad, the comparison, the divisiveness, all of it. We just need more people using it in, with intention, um, for the good yeah that's why i try to stay with watching the good news movement because it mm -hmm. makes me happy and the dodo because animals make me happy love it and i, try oh, to just I heard you to talking that. about your dogs oh. um that's how i am maria my dogs right oh. they're pure and they're unconditional mm -hmm. and i mean they're the greatest gifts for that reason um your book is such a gift and it's funny so you know it's marked up like crazy and pages are 
filed and cornered and whatever. And so just before I sat here to talk with you, um, I was in like a panic because I'm like, how do I, how do I boil it down? Right. How do I, mm. you know, you're so incredible and to do it justice. And so I was like, okay, I'm just going to write down like the aha moments, which mm. was a silly attempt, but it went from caged <laughs> to compromise, fitting in. And then it just like started working. Like it just started going down the list. Caged, compromise. These are the words I put in. Fit in, denying myself, snow globes, keeping mm. disarray to deny, destruction to construction, rebirth. And then it was <laughs> page 77. Well, let's go to page 77. I am a human being meant to be in perpetual becoming. My goal is not to remain the same, but to live in such a way that each day, year, moment, relationship, conversation, and crisis is the material I use to become a truer, more beautiful version of myself to human experience, right? So that goes to like, if this is our shared human experience, right? When you talk about how we hurt people and we're hurt by people, we feel left out, envious, not good enough, sick and tired. We have a we have unrealized dreams and deep regrets. We wish our parents had done better by us. We wish we could do better by our children. We betray and we are betrayed. We lie and we are lied to. There are so many of these that you go through. We believe, we absolutely do not believe. We are lonely, we want to be left alone. We want to belong, we want to be loved. So if this is our shared human experience, where do we get the idea that there is some other, better, more perfect, unbroken way to be human and then you'll never change the fact that being human is hard, so you must change your idea that it was ever supposed to be easy. And that's where I was like, okay, that's kind of everything I want to go through. <laughs> that's it. Right? Yeah, I just, if we could just tell people one thing, it would be, you know, if you're just confused and stressed and angry and in pain and lost then it's not you don't have a problem you just have a life mm -hmm. right that this is exactly what it is to be alive and especially right now oh my god mm -hmm. I mean I live with the happiest woman on earth she's like a pathological optimist and even she's a little depressed right now okay like what everyone's facing right now so important to say that yeah. I had someone call me yesterday, someone on my staff, and um, they were concerned about a family member who didn't want to be here anymore. Mm -hmm. And I said, please tell them they are not alone. Mm -mm. Everyone is feeling so at their end mm -hmm. or just can't take it anymore. And so I, I, I thank you for saying that because we're all going through this so we're not alone i mean it's it's That's a different right. story now um so i think yeah if if it's getting to her <laughs> that's how i think if it gets to abby we're all in trouble okay yeah so, yeah i used to when i was getting sober i just found the whole process to be so excruciatingly hard of it's just it's like defrosting you know you've been numbing yourself for so long and then everything hurts you're just like an exposed nerve and i was teaching at the time I actually was a very good teacher. It scares the shit out of people when I tell them that I was <laughs> getting sober and teaching, but I was a good teacher. Um, and I used to make my kids, We used to, I used to walk them the long way to PE every day because I had to walk by my friend Josie's classroom because she had this sign in her classroom above the windows that said, we can do hard things. Mm. Okay. And I had to see that we can do hard things every single day because being human is so um it's such a debacle and and quagmire in the fact that we are all so alone in the skin i, I maria I, I still can't fully understand this like i'm stuck in the skin forever like i'm, I'm alone in here mm -hmm. i'm alone in here forever right that is so terrifying but we're alone in here going through the pain going through the loss going through all of it alongside everybody else who is doing the same thing, right? That's the we, like I mm -hmm. might be alone in here, but I'm showing up to life and doing this hard stuff alongside everybody else. So I'm not alone, alone, I'm alone together. 
which you clearly know you've yeah. nailed this with the name of your show. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. And also this idea that, you know, I knew that hard things idea when I was teaching, like if a kid tried to was learning cursive. Okay. And they'd go, Miss Doyle, it's too, it's hard. And I would say, I know it's hard. That's good. That means you're on the edge of something. That means you're learning. Keep going. But we forget that concept when we're older. We think, oh, it's hard. So I'm doing something wrong or I yeah. should quit. Or I just, I have this feeling that right now it's very, very hard. Mm -hmm. We are in the pain, right? We're kind of in the pain. We're in the waiting at the same time. But I know I am a person who has been to rock bottom so many times. I've been to rock bottom of my addiction, of my personal life, of my marriage, of my career. And something beautiful always comes after. Yeah. And I just feel like in this moment where we are all just stuck and we are all feeling and we are all looking really hard at the cracks in our lives and our relationships and our institutions and our nation, we are tenderizing, right? Hard stuff makes us softer and it makes us more connected. And I think that we have the potential for coming into the after of this new and different. Um, so I would just say like, like I'd say to those, my kids who are learning cursive, like, I know it's hard, but that just might mean we're on the edge of something, right? Yeah. <laughs> like you can do hard things. Yeah. It's so true. And it's so important to, to vocalize that because you're right. As we get older, we're like, isn't it supposed to get better now? <laughs> mm, my experience is tragically no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it get, we get better. Yeah. Right. We get better. It's like everything's like a spiral staircase, right? We keep coming around to the same crap, same fears, same mm -hmm. trauma, same whatever, but we're stronger each time from yeah. the climb, right? We, it doesn't get easier, but we get better and we get stronger. I believe that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of like a collective rebirth, right? Mm -hmm. Like everything's getting destroyed because we need to reimagine everything, right? So a lot of us have had those moments individually. Mm -hmm. And now, like I used to say to people, how can I get people to have the revelations, aha moments that I've had since my brain surgery without having them have a brain tumor, mm -hmm. right? Like when people have tragic moments, they, they can change their lives because they've seen, you know, the end come really like front and center. Um, so that makes you make some changes and then COVID happened. And I'm like, well, I guess this is everyone's collective brain tumor right. because now we're forced to see what's truly important in life mm -hmm. and, um, and we're forced to reimagine. And that's what this time is. I, I will say that I've been getting to some kind of like hopeless moments where I'm like, oh shit, it's going to get way worse before mm -hmm. it gets better. And I do believe it's going to get way worse before it gets better. Um, but I think if we keep having these kinds of conversations where we all are talking to each other and not fighting with each other, but talking to each other and saying, oh, I'm feeling like this, then we're less alone, mm -hmm. right? Then it's like, mm -hmm. I had that moment last night with people. I was like, wait, you're feeling the same way? Oh, oh okay, cool. Like, I thought it was just me. Um, and when you are someone who's more kind of half full, glass half full, and you're feeling like this, then you really think something's wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's, and then it's when not. you're, when you're like me, who's actually like, you know, Eeyore a lot of the time, <laughs> because I have struggled with depression and anxiety my whole life. Then you don't know if you're getting depressed again, or if this is just life. Right. Yeah. I mean, a lot of my friends who struggle with mental health are confused right now. They're like, wait, am I getting depressed again? Or is life just really this depressing? Like, do I need help? Does the world need help? It's a confusing time for happy and cranky people. Yeah, <laughs> totally. But you know what I found? I have found that people who were depressed before are happier now because now everybody's depressed with them. Maria, listen, I could not agree with you more. <laughs> Abby said to me one day, why am I the upset one now? I said, because I have lived my life at a 10. Okay. Everybody else has been a four. Now everybody's an eight. Like I've been chicken little my whole life going, Oh God, you guys, this shit's going down. Sky is falling. <laughs> sky is falling. And then all the therapists are like, Oh, relax. And now I'm like, how you like me now, everybody? Yeah. <laughs> how you like me now? And also I have been learning my whole life how to show up and have hope yep. and get work done and even thrive 
while being terrified, mm -hmm. right? I've lived my whole life figuring things out while being anxious. So I think part of it is that people like me now feel like we have something to offer mm -hmm. because we've been training for this moment our whole lives, Maria. Yeah. <laughs> right? Or you feel less lonely. Like my brother totally. um, is undiagnosed, but definitely has his mental health issues and drives us crazy. And so um, I run <laughs> from him. Um, and so he's been so beyond nice and so mm. beyond cool and calm and sweet. And so I'm like, why is he so happy? He's never been happy. And I'm like, oh, there are no events for him to feel left out of. There's no engagement with people really to have any kind of uh, fights with, right? There's nothing but kind of peace in his life right now, right? Mm. He's going to our house in Connecticut. He's like taking care of the grass. There's no, nothing to disrupt him. Mm. And so we call him Pandemic Pete. Pandemic Pete. I mean, that's where I'm like, oh, Pandemic Pete's super happy. Like he's living life. <laughs> We're over here being like, ah, the world's ending. <laughs> and he's like, oh, and literally he's like, look at the bird that flew into my hand. And he's so cute. He's my little, a bird just came into his hand. And then, oh, look at the little turtle. And I'm like, who the frig are you? But yeah. <laughs> It's, it's interesting. That makes me so happy. Yeah. Abby turned to me on the couch. I must have been about day 20. Oh, sorry. About day 20 of quarantine. And she said, has your life changed at all? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is what I've always done is just stay inside and think about things. So yeah. for people like um, Pandemic Pete or me, there are silver linings here. Yeah. Yeah. So you talk about anxiety. It's funny. My husband was telling me yesterday, Maria, I think your mission is to figure out how to cure women of anxiety because I can definitely have um, some crippling moments with it. And mm. I know that I've denied it for so many years and just powered through. But, you know, going through a situation I've been going through recently, I'm now like, I can't even take a nap without scenarios going through the head and like they're like heightened dreamed versions of Wah! you know and and he's like if you lost your anxiety you would soar mm, and Abby I'm like says that to me all the time so so have you all figured out anything since I need to figure it out um no but Maria I feel like maybe like next Tuesday I'll have it all figured out <laughs> perfect <laughs> no, uh, can we no, have a session I figured Tuesday? out none of it I mean, I know in my head, like I, I know intellectually what the problem is, right? I know that um, I have always had control issues, mm -hmm. right? That I truly have a deep-seated belief that if I just worry enough, I will earn everyone's peace, right? That like I, if, if things are working out, it is because you I spent so much out. time suffering before the thing, right? Ridiculous. It's completely ridiculous. But this idea that I might live in a universe that will take care of me, as opposed to me taking care of the universe, is not something that I have fully been able to, <laughs> to embrace yet. Yeah. Although it is my goal, right? Um, I don't know. I think of it, I really do think of being, having clinical anxiety and depression um, it's like being Tigger, Tigger and Eeyore at the same time, right? It's like, I'm always too low or too high because mm -hmm. anxiety to me, does it feel high to you? It feels like a, like a shaky hovering to me. Like I'm never in the moment because in the moment is always fine. Yeah. Right. I, in the moment, you're always fine. It's the worrying yeah. about the moments to come. Yeah. 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 And I've gotten better. Like I've gotten really, really better in these last few years because I really do believe that the universe has our back and I really do believe that everything's happening for a reason and 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 not in that way but that there's a path that you have to trust that's kind of happening and like mm -hmm. you're being led right I mm -hmm. feel like I'm being okay. led mm -hmm. and so I do believe but there are moments where you just get that you're in that that shit moment mm -hmm. where you're just so crippled and you're in so much pain and you just can't breathe and you feel like, you know, Bigfoot is on your chest mm -hmm. that, um, that's crippling. And so, yeah, it sucks. I learned about trust with Abby. I think I learned about this control thing. Cause I do think that anxiety and, and control are like this. Okay. They're just tied together. Totally. And I used to be extremely controlling in my relationships. 
Okay. Like in my last marriage, I would have called myself like a good leader. Okay. But now I know that I was just controlling the shit out of everything. Like I just was the director of mm-hmm. my house was a cruise ship and I was like, just controlling everyone. But then I married Abby and she is like uncontrollable. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. and she also being married to a woman is so fascinating because the, the communication, Maria, I mean, all we freaking do is talk about feelings all day from beginning to end. It's yeah. just two women being married who are spiritual seekers, who are introspective and who are sober. So we have nothing else to do. Okay. So all <laughs> we freaking do is talk about our feelings. And one day she said, you know, I can tell you're doing that thing you do when you think I don't know you're doing it, but when you're manipulating me to be controlling, and I want you to know that it really hurts me because it makes me know that you don't trust me Mm. and I trust you so much and I respect you so much. And I just want you to trust me too. And that's the first time I really, um, put control and trust. I started to understand them that way because it's true, right? We can either love people or we can control them, but we can't do both because love requires trust. Yeah. Right. So we only control things that we don't trust. So, so in figuring out how to take control out of love in my relationship, now I just have to figure out how to apply that in all the other areas of my life. Right. Like how do I trust that the universe is taking care of me? How do you just go on the cruise? How do I just get on the cruise, Maria? Yeah. That's all I want. What you just said. I just want to be a passenger on the cruise. I just want to be a fucking passenger. And that's all I want. Yeah. Yeah. Because when I'm a passenger, I am so happy. <laughs> yes. Me too. Just tell me what to do. Tell me when dinner is. Tell yeah. me when arts and crafts are. I yeah. will be there. Like, and, and the, th- the thing is, Maria, I think we really are passengers. I think yeah. no matter what we believe or how much anxiety we have, we really are just passengers. Like, yeah, we're never the director. We no one appointed us as the director, by the no way. One no one vo- us. voted us in. I don't know why we think that we're the director. No one voted <laughs> us in. We voted ourselves in so we can vote ourselves out and just be because here's the thing. Like, first of all, everyone will be so much happier around us if we stop oh being the director that they didn't vote in. And secondly, we're so annoying. why we're is so it up to us to have to remember to sh- lock? Like every night I have to lock all the doors. Cause guess what? No one will lock the doors if I don't lock the doors. And then I have anxiety at night that someone's going to come in mm-hmm. and you know, well, we have a shepherd that will eat them, but that's still not enough now for me. I still have to go down, lock all the doors. Right. Mm-hmm. But I can't tell my husband because then it's on his honey do list and he doesn't want a mm-hmm. honey do list because who wants to be told what to do? Like he's not my kid. Right. Mm-hmm. And right. so, like, just fucking let the doors be unlocked. Who cares, right? Like, why mm-hmm. or why do we always have to? I gotta do this, and I gotta do that, and <gasps> mm-hmm. let it go. And then we're this, and then we do this martyr thing. Yep. So then, not only are we insisting we're the captain, then we're annoyed and bitter about being the captain. Yes, so and then- I marked something in here. Oh, this was so good. Um, this is it. Oh, I flipped right to the page. How about that? Um, you were talking about motherhood, right? And you said, I burned the memo presenting responsible motherhood as martyrdom. I decided that the call of motherhood is to become a model, not a martyr. I unbecame a mother slowly dying in her children's name and became a responsible mother, one who slows her children, one who shows her children how to fully be alive. I literally flipped to the right page because it was meant to be. Because we're not the director. Somebody directed you right to that page. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that was, that was a real serious, um, shift, maybe the toughest shift for me in the whole untaming process. Um, because I almost didn't, we haven't given the people any backstory, but I fell in love with Abby. Um, and I had to decide Give people the backstory really stay. quick. Give people the backstory really quick. Cause I love where it's, our conversation so has gone, it's... gone, but at the same time, like you have, no. you, it... you have such an incredible journey and I bet you can like truncate it to a degree. I don't think I can, but I'm going to tell you just this one part so I can, so this story works. Okay. So the concept of it will be understood. So I was, um, in a broken marriage to a good man. That's a very hard place to be, right? Because women are supposed to be freaking grateful for everything. So mm-hmm. we're just supposed to say it's good enough. Um, and then I fell in love with a woman named Abby. Okay, there you go. You're caught up. Perfect. So, <laughs> 
so I really had to decide whether I was going to just ignore this love, right? Whether I was going to just, um, well, abandon myself again, like I had for my entire life, um, or whether I was going to abandon everyone's expectations of me, right? And just follow this thing. Um, and I almost did abandon myself again because I um, felt like I could not hurt my children, right? Because I was tamed into believing that a mother does not do anything that brings pain to her kids, right? And then one day I was watching my little girl get ready and I thought, oh my God, I am staying in this marriage for my little girl. But would I want this marriage for my little girl? Mm. And if I would not want this marriage for my little girl, then why am I modeling bad love and calling that good mothering? Right? And like, the, the, the answer to that is simple. It's because I, we are all tamed to believe that the epitome of motherhood is martyrdom. Mm -hmm. It's to just slowly bury yourself, right? Just bury your dreams, bury your ambition, bury your emotion, bury all of it mm -hmm. in honor of your babies, right? Which is such horseshit. Yeah. That's just poison, that comes down from patriarchy that goes into every every version of womanhood that just says slowly disappear that's how you'll earn your sticker slowly disappear right and what a burden for the children of martyr mothers right to know to never know really know their mothers right yeah. but to know that if they do become parents they will too will have to slowly die because if we hold up mar martyrdom as the epitome of motherhood then that's what they will always be aiming for yeah right which is why all of my friends all of us who have martyr mothers are just begging the, the universe for an excuse to live right because our mothers didn't allow themselves to so p children will only allow themselves to live as fully as their parents allowed mm -hmm. themselves to live yeah so anyway that was just one example of like oh i see i am trying to fit myself into this little cage that somebody handed me without even really thinking without even really thinking is this version of what i'm doing the best thing for me or for my children? No, neither. Yeah. But that decision comes with so many Ooh. repercussions, right? Career and, you know, marriage and just the, it's literally just nuking your entire world. Yes. Right? What you wanted to do to social media, that's what yes. I did to my own life. <laughs> yeah. Which is why, and at, at a certain age, most people just kind of stay with it and just say, okay, well, you know, I should just be happy and lucky that I even have this. Mm -hmm. Right? Like anybody around you, oh my God, that that scene, I call it a scene because this is like a movie to me, that, that part in the book um, where you talk about the appointment you have with your therapist um, where your therapist is just trying to keep you in this scenario that you're telling her is not who you are, not what you want. And I mean, it's a very powerful part. <laughs> it's a very powerful chapter and very powerfully, uh, uh, labeled. Um, but yeah, I, I think that even I have probably given people advice trying to keep everybody together because I'm always like, well, the grass isn't always greener. Like, <laughs> And that's true. Yeah. And that's true. And, you know, most of my friends, I would say that 90% that of women who are really honest will tell you that they have discontent, right? That, that there's discontent inside of that they can, that they long for something different or mm -hmm. more, that they would look at their lives or their relationships or their job or their community or their nation and say, oh, I think it was maybe supposed to be more beautiful than this. Yeah. Right. But I think we don't honor that discontent because we are taught that, that that's shameful because we're supposed to be grateful yeah. for what we have. Right. But there's something beautiful that happens when women actually do honor their discontent. Right. When they, when they stop saying to themselves, well, maybe the fact that I can imagine more means I'm ungrateful. And they start saying, maybe the fact that I can imagine more means that I was made for more. Right. And this doesn't always look like leaving your husband to marry a female Olympian. Okay. Mm -hmm. Although I highly recommend it for all <laughs> viewers. But 
what it often means is just having hard conversations. Yeah. Right. Most of my friends, most of them want different relationships, but they want different relationships with the same person that they're in relationship with. Right. They just want to be brave enough to say the hard thing, like to say, no, actually I need this. Yeah. Actually, I want this from you. Actually, this is the kind of relationship I, I want to be seen in this way. I want to be cherished in this way. I want to like, so, but, but those conversations are so hard and they rock the boat, right? Yeah. So, you know, some parts of this aren't, they aren't, they don't have to be dramatic. They're just like, we as women have been taught to be peacekeepers, right? So we think we're not supposed to say the thing that will cause any kind of disruptive disruption because there's a price to pay for that. Mm -hmm. But, but the, the part of the calculation that we haven't been focused on is that there's a price to pay for not doing it also. Yeah. Cancer and so many other ailments. Let's be real because we're going against our grain and we are slowly dying. That's why I'm sure you've read Anita Morjani's book, Mm -hmm. dying to be me. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. You literally just die a Mm -hmm. slow, painful death because Mm -hmm. we are, as you said, you know, you, you said around age 10, that's when the taming begins, right? Mm -hmm. You start this book with this beautiful story about a cheetah that was tamed with a Labrador. So the cheetah acted like the Labrador. And then wait, all of a sudden you're like, wait, why should a cheetah live its life like a Labrador when it's a friggin' cheetah? And so the equation there with with us as women is the same thing we're caged as well in the the confines of what the world says we're supposed to be mm-hmm. and that cage is locked really tightly and it's friggin awful mm-hmm. and i mean you have such a beautiful way with words and such a beautiful way of visualizing it for us um and it's so important because you know, when you continue to deny yourself and what you want, there's nothing good that's going to come in the end mm-hmm. from that. No. And we think it's, we think that that's what our people need because that's another lie that's been taught to us. Like we are doing it in honor of someone else. I don't know. Like we, as women have been taught that love means to just disappear. Mm-hmm. Right. When actually love, it actually means the complete opposite. Like love requires us to fully emerge, right? That's, if, if there's any other definition, I don't know. Like you can't be loved. You can't be truly loved in, unless you are fully emerged, right? Mm-hmm. So what we're doing when we hide ourselves over and over again to serve, to placate, to peacekeep, is then then we're just taming everyone else. We're just taming our children. Mm-hmm. We're taming everybody. Like, one of the most, one of the things that I know to be true is that the best way we can have friends who see us, we can raise children who believe that they are allowed to be fully human is just to be fully human in front of them. Right? Yeah. Because these cages aren't just for women. I mean, you know, around oh. 10. So we're born these wild individual selves, right? We rely completely on our creativity, on our imagination, on our emotions, on our intuition. And then right around 10 is when our, we start to internally formalize. We, we start to really understand social conditioning. Okay. So the signs, everything's happening to us before then, but right from, well, they say from seven to 12. Okay. Is when we start realizing, Oh, I'm a girl and this is how girls act. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm a boy. And this is how boys, Oh, I'm a Christian. And this is what Christians believe. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm an American. And this is what Americans say. Oh, I'm a Doyle right? And this is how Doyle's act. Oh, I'm an immigrant. And this is how immigrants have to be like, we, we just have all of these little cages and we have to lose or we don't lose it. We think we can lose it, but we just swallow or hide all of our individuality and humanity so that we can mm-hmm. fit inside these little cages. Right. And, and, and by the way, that is, that was like, that was herd survival for a very long time. Right. We knew we needed our pack and we would do whatever it took to stay with the pack. And you know, Maria, what happens if you defy the pack? I mean, I have defied the pack inside of Christianity. That goes real well, let me tell you. Like, <laughs> the, pack, the pack is just super understanding and sweet mm-hmm. about that. Very, right? They're very Christian about it. <laughs> <laughs> so right, just how Jesus would have acted. Yes yes, 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 yes. But also, when you're with your family, when you start acting out of line, when, with, when you're not, 
you know, the good immigrant or whatever, when you're, when you're a girl who is ambitious and loud, when you're a boy who cries and is vulnerable, right? When you're an American who questions um, patriotism, when you're, when you're a Republican who actually sides with the Democrat, when you're a Democrat who actually sides, we are so freaking tribal right now, right? And we're giving up all of our humanity and our individuality for protection from the tribe. And that's not how we're gonna survive anymore, right? Like we're at this place in humanity where our survival literally as a planet depends on us resisting that urge mm -hmm. to hide our individuality for protection from the pack. We have to separate from the pack and reclaim our humanity and our conscious consciences, right? And our intuition and our emotions and our imagination. That's what this next after is going to require, yeah. right? For us just to all emerge fully, fully human and say, no, 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 no. This, this was pissing me off and we're going to do this differently. Like, this is how I imagine this next thing. And this is how I was going to, it's going to require everybody to emerge fully. Yeah. What I think. Something hit me when you were talking about, um, the taming, I, I forget what it was actually, but I realized the reason we are controlling is because we were so tamed and we have no mm -hmm. control over ourselves because we've lost ourselves. So then we go try controlling other people. Okay. Wow. I wasn't really trying to go to therapy today, Maria. But... <laughs> right? <laughs> I know that is true. Yeah, and that just one of the way, reasons that I know that is true also is because one of the ways that I was most caged is how I ended up with an eating disorder when I was ten. Is every message on earth that tells little girls that they have to be small, in body, right? And I have untamed myself from messages about girls being small in ambition, in voice, in dream, in imagination, crushing it. Okay, crushing those, but I still cannot. Like the messages about being small body wise are just like ground into me. Like I cannot shake it. I'm still so weird about it. Um, and I know that, you know, every once in a while I will realize, oh, I'm back in that kind of thinking. Okay. 50% of my thoughts today were about food, exercise, all of that. Yeah. And that's all about control, right? I realized that I do not love myself. I do not love my body because if I loved my body, I would trust my body. Yeah. But instead I spend all day controlling my body. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly what you said. Like some of those messages that we get, some of that taming just takes a freaking lifetime to undo because we are taught not to trust ourselves as girls and women. Yeah. Right. I mean, Maria, the first, the first story I was ever taught about girls and boys and God. Okay. Like, Oh, the Adam I'm and Eve story. CCD. Yeah. Yep. I read that and I was like, Oh my God. I'm at CCD. Okay. This is Catholic Sunday school. Right. And the teacher says, come sit down. Everybody sit down. I'm going to teach you about how God made man and women. And I was like, Oh my God, this is amazing. This is like a big freaking deal. I'm so excited to learn this. And she says, okay, so I'm going to, this isn't exactly how she said it. I'm just giving a synopsis, how I heard it. Okay. So she says, okay, so there was God and God made Adam and God and Adam are like bros. Okay. Everything was awesome. They were besties. Okay. And then Adam got bored and needed some help naming the animals. So God made Eve. And then this bitch comes around, right? <laughs> And she wants more. She wants to know more. She gets curious. She's not just grateful for what she has in the garden. She goes for more. And then all suffering is unleashed on the earth. And all of their descendants are cursed forever. Go with God, girls. Right? Shit. <laughs> I mean, the misogyny in that interpretation of that story. Like, okay, so... It's all when, our fault. When we trust ourselves, all hell breaks loose. Yep. That is the moral of that story. Yeah. Be grateful for what you have. Do not ask for more. Mm -hmm. Girls, do not ask for more. Don't more. be hungry. Yeah. And don't be hungry. Jesus, she just wanted an apple. What if she wanted a pizza? Galaxies would what have What if exploded. she wanted to be the president? Oh. Don't be hungry. Don't be ambitious. Don't be hungry. Mm -hmm. Don't want more. It's, yeah, that's it at the root of all of it mm -hmm. at the root of all misogyny is make sure that women don't want more 
Because if we want more and we start re- we start requiring it, relationships would be balanced, mm-hmm. right? Institutions would crumble and have to be rebuilt. National governments would burn to the ground, and ha- that's what we want. We want worlds to end so that we can rebuild, right? New relationships, new families, new communities, new nations, new institutions that are based on equality. Yeah. We got to just eat the apple and let it all burn. Yeah, yeah. but I think that's kind of the the overarching issue, right? Is we don't want to be uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. So all of these changes, whether it's Black Lives Matter or women or any kind of equal, it's like we don't want to be uncomfortable, right? Mm-hmm. Uncomfortable brings us back to that that middle place of pain and suffering. And guess what? I want to just take a helicopter ride way over to happiness island (laughs) i just want to go there i don't want to feel like shit you know it's like we all live our lives trying to avoid pain and seek as much pleasure as we can and that's not always the way yeah because then it's just fake pleasure it's not real Mm -hmm. it's not real joy like i haven't really gotten to any place that was true joy without some Joan of Arc shit first. Yeah. Like straight towards yeah. whatever thing I'm trying to avoid. Well, and because right? we're all connected and and what I think a lot of people may not realize is just how connected we are. And mm-hmm. so when one isn't happy, the other one truly can't be either. Yeah. Yeah, we're those forests. We're like the trees and then you learn my son is into all these nature documentaries and you find out that there are these all of these intricate systems where all the roots are connected mm-hmm. underneath and so when one tree is sick like it affects this one all the way over here like if we could see on whatever level what humanity is it would be like that yeah like you'd be like oh it does matter to them what yeah. i'm doing here mm-hmm. yeah. yeah and that's why we're better together yeah, that's why we're better together. God, bringing it right back around, <laughs> full circle. It's so true. Every time I have a conversation, you know, in here or outside, I'm like, we're better together. Okay. <laughs> like, you know, it's just the truth. Um, yeah. Your book is incredible. Um, you are incredible. I feel so grateful that we got to have this conversation. Um, and I think, you know, the moral of the story, or some of the moral, one of the morals of the story today is like, you know, we're, we've we've lived our lives, I think, kind of slowly burying ourselves, right? I wrote that before you said it. I wrote, we bury ourselves. Because you're like, mm-hmm. there was all this st- stuff. And it's true. Like, I, I feel like I slowly, you know, built my own kind of grave. And then the dirt kept piling on. The dirt kept mm-hmm. piling on. Then you can't really see clearly. And then you're just lost. And then, you know, I went to a seminar, uh, a Tony Robbins seminar, and like, cleared out my eyeballs and I was like wait I can want more and not feel guilty that I want more out of life and mm-hmm. oh there are some tools that I could actually use to like get me out of this shit okay cool like then started clearing out more and started clearing out more and started unburying myself and um I think it's it's the process of unburying ourselves if you know we've already done it but then you know if you're in the midst of it as a young person and i know a lot of young women listen to this it's like don't let yourself get buried Mm-mm. like be yeah. to thine own self be true <laughs> yes that's that's it and that's what i'm just desperate with my little girls and my little boy just that's why the dedication is to the women who who are resurrecting themselves and to the girls who will never be buried like the goal is to never be tamed. So you don't have to go through this untaming shit in your forties. Yeah, <laughs> right? I like, know. Just hold on to yourself. Hold, abandon. I tell my little girls, your job is to disappoint as many people as you need to, to avoid disappointing yourself. Oh my God. Oh my God. And when I said that to Tishy, she said, even you. And I said, oh God, especially me. I mean, especially your parents, right? Wow. Because your parents are the ones that you're living for your whole freaking life. And then you yeah. f- wake up and you're 50 and you're still trying to impress your daddy, right? Yeah. So yeah, if I could just, just keep disappointing people, just disappoint as many as it takes, but don't, don't abandon yourself. Yeah. Yeah, because everybody can be part of the herd. 
Mm -hmm. right? It's like the true individuals that rise that are the greats that we all look to. And that's why when someone untames themselves and has the balls to write about it and tell their their story about how they rigged their high school election, <laughs> their high school superlatives, I was like, oh my God, no, she did it. That's amazing. That's amazing. And like, and your wife being like, are you really going to tell that story? And you're like, shit, yeah, I'm going to tell that story about, you know, I don't know what the, it was a golden goddess. What was golden? It's like homecoming court. Yeah. Maria, I rigged the election. She I wanted to be golden, the- guys. So she rigged mm-hmm. her homecoming court election and she was golden. Wow. You are golden. Glennon, you're golden. Fake gold. No. Fool's gold. No. no. <laughs> Here's the problem. They didn't see your goldenness then. So you made sure right. that they did. Okay. <laughs> So you were like, you assholes don't see me. So I see me and I'm going to make you see me. And then that's that. Um, but Maria, I le- you're ride or die. I can tell. <laughs> if you're going to try to excuse rigging the high school election I for am. me, then you are my people. I totally am. And you are my person too. And I'm like, I feel like I just made a new best friend today. Me I always too. say me I am too. creating my, my new tribe with this show. I'm like finding my people. And so, yeah, no, I am your ride or die. And I thought that was friggin' brilliant because, you know, it's, um, it's uh, a high school. Oh, that's a whole high other discussion. School, yeah. At least we made it through that. We survived it. We can do that. <clears throat> we can do anything. Yes, we can. Um, thank you so much. This was mm. so incredible and such a joy and so helpful <clears throat> um, for people because it's scary to to you know reinvent. And we are in a period where I feel like we all are going to have to reinvent whether we like it or not. Um, But we're going through it together. So use this moment to to read Untamed and find out what your reinvention is through um, Glennon's reinvention and rebirth. And I don't know. I just think that um, living who you are is, is scary. And we all talk about it. Like, be yourself and be yourself. And sometimes it's like, I don't know how to be myself because I fucking buried mm-hmm. myself so deep. I don't even know who she is. That's it. Stop saying, I don't know who I am. That's exactly it. That yeah. It takes a while, don't you think? It takes a while. If you've spent decades being somebody else, it takes a little while to rediscover yourself. Yeah. Absolutely. We got to be patient. We got to be patient. I have a great episode with Susie Batiste. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but no. she um, she created Poopery. You know the- oh, yeah. 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 You would love her. Um, And uh, at some point when we can have social events again, I'll connect us all and we can do something because she's so amazing. But she talked about how she lives her life with like her guiding forces are, is this, do I feel resonance with this or do I feel dissonance with this? Mm -hmm. So to try to find yourself, I think it's really important um, to use the signals, the emotions that your body is giving you. So if something doesn't feel good and you're like, oh, it's going to take forever. Oh, it's going to be fucking hours. How many long? Ugh, ugh. Then that's dissonance. That's not who you are. It's not what you want to be. Mm-hmm. Say no. Mm-hmm. If it's something mm-hmm. that like lights you up and you want to like fly to the moon, you're like, I can do this all day and I can do it for free. That's who you are. That's where you need to move towards. So it's like the towards yeah. and the away. And so as you're trying to find yourself that just hit me. You might want to listen to that episode and we'll put the link to it in the summary, but also, um, it's a great way to start. And then through another episode, and I can't remember who the expert was, but it's kind of like writing a list of the things that light you up and make you feel great. Mm -hmm. And then just try to live in that because that's how you're going to find who you really are. Because the other shit was stuff that people put on you, right? Like think of what lit you up at eight years old. And mm-hmm. what, you know, like I was drawing cartoons and I was, I was drawing and drawing really well. Have I drawn since? No. Have I been mm-hmm. really creative since? No. I went into like get shit done mode, be a producer, like hustle and all this stuff. And where I think I'm supposed to be is more creative. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's my part of my journey that I'm, I'm going down. I mean, just to be clear, just to be clear, you are literally sitting in the middle of this beautiful space that you have created for women and people to come together and feel comforted and challenged. So 
you're being a little creative. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Like, like right now. I think I'm being helpful, but you know, what's funny is after I read your book and after I read how you talk about it in terms of like your creativity, I never thought about, um, I never thought about that connection. And so, yeah, I think maybe, yeah, you're right. Maybe this is, yeah, you're creating the shit out of stuff right now, Maria. Thanks. You know, we always say, first of all, we, in my family and my business, we call it warm. Like, does this feel warm or cold? That's all I want to hear from women anymore. I don't want your entire spiel about why this person isn't right. Is this, uh, is this opportunity right? Don't give me the paragraphs. Does this feel warm or cold? I love that. This feels cold. Got it. Got it. Moving on. Like that's tr- because we're, we as women are not are only used to trusting our brains, which are hamster wheels of shit, right? <laughs> but our bodies will always tell us the truth. Yes. Right. So does it feel warm or cold? That's all I need to know. And then also, like one way to get women out of their heads, because women will always come to me and say, "Okay, I'm feeling discontent in my marriage, but I can't." say this because of this, but I, I'm supposed to be grateful. I'm, so they used words like can't, supposed to, should. These are all indoctrination words, right? This means you're lost in your head. So the idea is to bridge you from your indoctrination head to your imagination, indoctrination to imagination. And the way I found to do that with women is you just say, okay, tell me about the truest, most beautiful marriage you can imagine. Okay. This question, every time, 100% of the times, it shuts down this excuse making brain and it activates this imagination because everybody can tell you a story about the truest, most beautiful relationship they can imagine, family they can imagine, job they can imagine, um, community they can imagine. And then you get people to write it down. The truest, most beautiful. You don't have to do any of it. Don't get scared. Julia, you have to do, not, never has to come to life. Just write it out. And then that becomes like this treasure map because we all think that our imaginations are pipe dreams, but actually that's where our marching orders live. Yeah. Right. So while you're scared of finding yourself, while you don't know, I've had so many friends saying, I don't know what I want to do with my life. I don't even know what I want for dinner. Right. We are not good at wanting or owning our wanting. So this exercise of just taking a minute, trying to activate your imagination and using the words true and beautiful instead of right and wrong right? Because right and wrong, wrong are just culturally constructed words. They are not pure. They are not true. They are not from imagination. I have found that exercise help so many people because it's like, we can't make the thing just from our heart. It's like how architects, they have to have the, have the dream, have the vision, and then they have to put it on paper and then they can build it, right? It's Mm -hmm. like, the, the, the manifestation has to come one dimension at a time, right? So that's just another idea. Like if you are struggling in your marriage, stop, get out of the can'ts, get it out of the shoulds, get out of the fear and just do an exercise. What's the truest, most beautiful thing you can imagine? Yeah. And you might find your marching order set. I love that. Great advice. Glennon, will you be my new best friend? Yes. Done. Yay. BFFs, ride or die. <laughs> I am so um, lit up. This was so amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time and for sharing, uh, of course, her book, Untamed, which came out this year during quarantine of all times, mm-hmm. um, can be found anywhere books are sold. Her nonprofit, Together Rising, that transforms collective heartbreak into effective action, um, uh, can be found where, Jeff? It's togetherrising.com. We'll make sure it's in the description, in the episode description as well. Perfect. And you can find her on social media at Glennon Doyle. We'll put that in the summary as well. And you're amazing. Thank you. You're amazing. This is wonderful. This is just absolutely wonderful. I could talk to you all day. Thank you. Me too. Me too. This is the longest interview I've ever done, actually, because I just couldn't stop. And I really oh. wish I could keep going. I have a dentist appointment. Guys, I'm going to the dentist today. Oh, I'm scared. Oh, God, that's so oh, brave. Lord. Right? I didn't realize like, oh, uh, I set the schedule up, this up in January. So it's like my next appointment. And now I'm like, should I be canceling this? Like, I didn't even think. Wear your mask there. I'm sure I think I, I actually did go to the dentist last week and it was okay. I felt okay about oh, it. Oh, okay, good. Maybe that's yeah. why I was supposed to say this right now. Yes. 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 And I, I made Abby tell them beforehand, no floss shaming. I don't want you to give me any shaming 
don't ask me when the last time I flossed was. You know it's the last time I was here. I don't. <laughs> I know. The only time I floss is if there's steak in my teeth. <laughs> I got to get that shit out. I'm like, okay. Same. I'll I, do it in yeah. that I'm case. I'm so yeah. using that next time I go to the dentist. No floss shaming. Yeah. None. I will, I will turn I this car around. That. I am a grown up. I am a grown up. Dead. That's amazing. Glennon, thank you so much. Have an amazing day. I'm going to be in touch. <laughs> Good luck at the dentist. Thank you. Bye. Oh my God. I am obsessed. I, I just feel freaking like love her. Our shows keep getting better and better. Oh my God. We're on such a high roll. Don't you, you feel guys, like they're yes. weaving into each other too? Like yes. Yeah. She literally said, she's like, you know, I just think we need to use our emotions as indicators and signposts and not directions. Yeah. And wow. On Thursday, Susan said, "Our emotions are data, not directives." Yeah. That's like spooky. <clears throat> it's it's called we're bringing in the best people. Yeah. And the best minds are collectively thinking in the same kind of realms and like, damn. I mean, obsessed. Obsessed. Right. Obsessed. That tip at the end too about the what is it? True and beautiful versus right and wrong. Ooh, I'm using that. Right? So And I good. love warm and cold. Warm yeah. and cold. How do you feel? Mm -hmm. Guys, she is amazing. I literally feel like I could fly to the moon right now. I'm so excited. Yeah. I mean, you won't be surprised to learn. Like, her click is like Elizabeth Gilbert. And yeah. Martha, you know, I know I didn't like... get to that part in the book. I, I mean, I to talk about it, but I loved her meeting with Elizabeth and, yeah. um, and their instant friendship. And it was just, I was actually nervous before this interview. And I'm never really nervous. I think it's because you knew, I mean, you always kick ass, Maria, but you knew you had a great mind and you just wanted to mine it for all you could. And yeah. The thing that I so admire, and you know, I like hosting too, all of us do. And the thing I've come to really admire about you is like, what if we went in and tried talking to the people that we bring on rather than like interviewing them? Yeah. It's funny because like that's something that you've brought to the industry and it feels like this really simple thought, but it's kind of radical. Yeah. Um, but it's led to these incredible conversations. I just feel like, you know, I'm just taking notes every day and it's just so great. Thanks. Totally, totally agree, Jeff. I feel like I'm always so in awe, Maria, when I watch you. I'm like, okay, she's just starting just to chat. And then you you get the best stuff out of these people because you really are just having a conversation. Yeah, They're your friends. And I love it versus like the jumping in with questions that kind of jar, like, I don't know, get them off the pat. It's the best. Yeah. So Tell me why you wanted to, you. to write this book. <laughs> right. I mean, come on. Right. Like, I can't. No. But I think, um, but thank you guys. I just, I don't know. I, I, I am so excited. I was telling Kevin, um, even this morning before my meditation, I'm like, I, I, um, I need to keep forming my tribe. I, I feel like I was so heads down working for so many years and and then I had other distractions and whatever. And I'm like, I really need these friendships in my life. I really need these people that <clears throat> I'm simpatico with that I, you know, that I can help, that they can help. Like there's, you know, there's that exchange. And it's funny. I went and I met um, our guest. Uh, wait, what day? It was Aaron last week. Aaron Falconer. What day was she? Uh, she was Wednesday, Wednesday of last Wednesday. week. So yeah. I went and I met her for breakfast it was my first like Ooh. go out thing and we just like instantly clicked like I felt the same thing with her on the show and she's amazing and we had such a great conversation and um yeah I just feel so so lucky that um that I get to do this and that I I get to hoard amazing people <laughs> Right. Well, you're sharing you're it. Hoarding. You're not hoarding. Exactly. You're sharing. You're sharing with I am everyone. sharing. That's true. That's yeah. true. Um, all right. Well, guys, I hope you loved the show as much as we did. If you did, please share it with friends that will love it too. And help us by subscribing to YouTube and tell those friends to subscribe too. And I want to ask you just quickly, Maria, I know there's a lot of people listening right now who responded the way I did and probably specifically women who responded a ton more. Oh yeah, It's really easy to hop on iTunes, on Apple Podcasts. You're helping share the show. I'm not usually as urgent about this, but you're helping share the show. So please, please, please hop on Apple Podcasts and write that review. If you felt moved by today. Yeah, Sarah wrote difference. on Friday, best show ever. What? 
I saw this hey. one uh, this morning and she said, Maria is my go-to show. I look forward to my daily episode treat every day. Thank you, Maria and company for all you do sharing this with my friends. We are better together. Right. And I was like, yeah, thanks Sarah. Um, but I we got to, we're at 764 ratings. Help us get to a thousand, please. Let's do it before July, the end of July. If we Ooh, can make it, oh, we yeah. can do that. August 1st, we start with a thousand. I'm going to give some gifts away. I love Actually, that. Actually, I was thinking about it. I have a lot of gifts I would like to share with our audience. And so um, let's figure that out after the show. How about that for a tease, guys? Love um, that. Gifts from my closet. Okay. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, you can follow us at Maria Menunos, at Glennon Doyle, at Ryan Nelson, at Jeffrey Crane Graham, at Kels Meyer, too. Remember, 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 remember. Guys, my brain is so fried yesterday, I couldn't say the right names. Someone to say, hi, I'm Ryan. I'm like, did you say Jeff? And I'm like, they're like, no, Ryan. I'm like, oh, shit. Um, and then every word was coming out wrong. So I think I'm a little fried and I don't know. You've been doing a lot. Shit's getting real in the brain. But anyway, um, be nice people, make good choices, and be present.